Um, we're going to ask you in a moment to start forming some uh, lines or cues, as Tara Mack likes to say, uh, on either side of the, of the stage. And um, you'll see we've added chairs. The panelists are alternating chairs right now. And there, will, there are spaces for audience members, for us, for participants to join the conversation on stage. We're going to try to do this in a, a, a three or four waves, seeing how it works with time. And the idea is that you're coming up to continue the conversations, but to do it publicly in a fishbowl nature. Um, I'm going to try to manage this. And, and, and we, will, we will see how it goes. So um, Jody is to my left, your right. Patricia to my right, your left. Um, they'll make sure no one trips up the stairs and, and that kind of thing. And, and we'll, be, we'll be coming up. Um, do we have good conversations? Yes, yes, yes. People are all talking. This is good. These moments to talk to each other, these are the, these are the real moments in, this, in these gatherings. So. Um, so don't all rush at once, but, um, but do we have some folks? And, and I should, does anyone, uh, PS, do you, Sharon, does anyone know where Sharon is? Oh, here she is, here she is, okay. All right, all right, round of applause for folks. All right, here we go. Is it? Here we go. Right, sit, sit right where that mic is. Just don't sit on it. Sharon, why, you, you can join us in this empty chair at the end. Uh, can the folks who just joined us share your names and where you're from very quickly, please? Hi, my name is Annie. I'm a special education teacher here in Chicago Public Schools and a proud member of Chicago Teachers Union. Good afternoon. My name is Ani Mualimu. I teach 10th grade world history in Columbus, Ohio. Hi. My name is Abdul Kanji, and I'm from New York, Brooklyn. <laughs> and I represent, and I represent GAP, Global Action Project. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi, my name is Tiana. I'm from Philadelphia, and I'm also a member of Philadelphia Student Union, much like Philadelphia. So thank you. I, I just want to point out that the Brooklyn person was like Brook New York, Brooklyn, right? That's how Brooklyn people are. It's like the New York is later. Brooklyn is first. Um, so uh, here we got. I, I'm here to just sort of move the flow. So I'm not going to throw any questions out. I'm going to ask one of our new faces to, to share why, what moved you to come up. What is it that you wanna, want us to kind of discuss? When they share a comment, I, I want us to, to, to work with that for a little bit as a panel. Then it becomes a conversation amongst everyone on the stage. And then we'll move to the next. And we're, we're, this is going to be this is an experiment, like I said. So we'll, we'll see how the conversation flows. Can, can we work with that? Yes? Who would who'd like to open us up? Sure. Hi. Um, so I really wanted to come up here because I wanted to represent a new teacher's perspective. I grew up in New York City, and I've been in Chicago for two years, so I know the ins and outs of mayoral control and the lack of school board representation amongst us, really. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit of what's been happening in the multiple schools I've worked with in Chicago, where students have been pulled out of different schools, bused to my school. Um, we're going to lose 40 students from our school this year because they're going back to their zone district. We're going to lose after school programs because of budget cuts. We're going to lose ink um, from our printers, which we need money for. We're going, we're going to lose possibly two or three teacher positions. Inclu and I may be in danger, although I'm special education, so hopefully federal um, funding will help me there. But anyway, um, what I want to share is that, again, as Karen said earlier, we need actionable steps in order to help our teachers, our students, actually fight against this corporatization of education. Um, most of my teachers don't know about these issues. I've been studying this for many years now, and it's very hard to even get them on my side, or not my side, our side, um, 
to really get them to know what's going on, that this is a top-down approach, that we don't have a voice right now. Um, for me, it's been about getting the logic there, getting all the data and the research and everything in front of me. As one of my people in my group said earlier, that we have to have it all in order to be able to fight this fight. So we need everyone to be able to back us up, to wear the red shirts every Friday, which I do. Um, and I'm, I hope you all do too. Um, so I have to be the person in my school, along with other people in my school, to voice that. I need to be able to tell my students that I do care for them and that I'm wearing red today because I believe in teacher rights and I believe in your rights and I'm fighting for you. Um, so I guess that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Does it, any of the other new, new faces have sort of a teacher-oriented line of conversation that we want to continue? Hello again, my name is Ani, and uh, <clears throat> I'm coming from Columbus, Ohio. It is a situation where, as I've explained, the oppression hasn't squeezed out so much misery among people that they have collectively and overtly politically organized. Uh, of course, it, it, it happens everywhere. So I think we are in a unique position <clears throat> to, to begin something that's more on the prevention and in fact put uh, to be more on our toes versus be on our, being on our heels or what's going on. And, and, and I see first uh, getting with the parents uh, organizing parents as a way, uh, as the first level, uh, and then young people. My, my issue is that, uh, that there, there needs to be a lot of support in that because the numbers are few in, in Columbus who are sort of ready to kind of take that, um, that mantle. So while there are all these other organizations from bigger cities who have a longer history of organizing, my specific question is, what type, of, can there be some type of organized online platform learning? Because people are doing uh, consciousness raising in the cities where they're from. Uh, and they're organizing teachers and parents and, and building that leadership capacity. But if there could be some type of online forum that that can happen in a very systemic and organized way so that other cities who may not have that critical mass of consciousness can still benefit from that work that's being done. And perhaps, again, like I said, not be on the, the heels and trying to fight back from all the things that are coming, but rather kind of look at it ahead of time and put protections in so we can even make it something where maybe bigger other cities that have more people can then, it could be a point of hope versus a point of like, we're trying to fight back something that's happening. Mm -hmm. Can I that? and, and just to speak to Ani's point, um, there, there is, you know, we have Facebook, right? We have, we have Facebook, we have YouTube, we have Twitter, but I know that there's also the, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Network for Public Education, a group that Diane Ravage has started to try to help uh, pull together some voices. There are many different ways, and, and we can continue, especially uh, you know, in, that, in that parent realm and student realm, um, to uh, form the kind of online connections that we need to. We could start right here. Uh, you know, we all have that hashtag. You know, if every one of us who do Twitter would you know, send out a tweet, we could connect with each other. Uh, here, uh, I'm sure we can pass around a piece of paper with, you know, email addresses and phone numbers so that we can begin. We could, could, we could make our own Facebook page, you know, the Free Minds, Free People uh, nationwide network to save public education, whatever. We, you know, we could do what we want to do. Yeah, uh, my, my, uh, my issue is, not, is tough related to it, but my issue is about my school is I just want to deal with the process. I'm sure. not trying to take your voice at all, brother. Um, for those of you that don't know, and if you haven't read it, you know, Badass Teachers is a, um, uh, a website that is just out of control. And it's got, what, 21,000 members on it. It's just like growing. Um, and, and the interesting piece about it is there are all kinds of different voices. and 
you know, one of the things that's, that's problematic, as we said earlier, how do, you, how do we come together when we have different spaces and different ideas? And, you know, people who don't believe in social justice, who believe that we should just be working on one thing or something or other, you know, you're going to have to find your space within that context. But the, the main issue, though, is to keep the information open. Um, I talked to some brothers and sisters over on the side here that wanted to know more about Stand On Children because they were coming into their state with their crazy laws. And what are they doing? They're talking that longest school day myth again. So the, the, the key is that they do not reinvent the wheel, and neither should we, because that keeps us in constant disarray. So what we need to do to figure out, again, what's the message, how do you push it forward, and how do you keep that message consistent and constant, and all we have to do is go to the ALEC website, go to the Broad website. The beauty of these arrogant people is that they put the blueprints out there for you to see. So they're there, it's not as if, but, but everyone has to take some ownership over going to get that information, disseminating it within your networks, but your networks have to continue to grow. Yeah, my, uh, my type is the, the school because I'm here today to just get some advice or some answers about what's going on in my school uh, for, uh, for now. We Okay. <laughs> All right. Bec uh, my school has some issues. I'm here today to get some answers, you know, some uh, some uh, some encouragement, because my school is is a kind of international school. Only immigrants are allowed over there. Only immigrants that are coming from uh, the country and uh, they're going over there because they don't know how to speak English. That's the uh, that's way that they always go. My school is International High School Lafayette, but the school is in the list, getting uh, is about to be closed up because there's a lot of gang violence uh, thing in Brooklyn over there, because like the thing uh, you was talking about the red shirt thing, because uh, near my school anybody that wear red, everybody think oh your blood, your crib, all this, all that, but. That's why, like, uh, student as uh, there's many students in my school ch ch uh, are afraid to come to school because they they might get jumped at school or during school or at the end of school. Because this year on my school there was only 56 seniors, only 40, 40 of them graduate because the rest of them drop out, and we're on the list right now. And the thing that because they call my house, tell them if I, if I want to change my school. But I say no. So the thing I started doing, I posted on Facebook. I posted to all my friends. Do not apply to any. Uh, do not apply to any of the call that the call, uh, if thing the, uh, the educational board call you. Do not apply to say oh you want to change the school because the school is for the new and uh, the new people that come in the school because they don't have nowhere else to go. They don't know how to speak English. They don't want to put in the school that they don't feel comfortable in and unsafe. Because there's many school in Brooklyn over there that's really unsafe, that's uh, in a bad, in a bad thing, in a bad environment, and near project, and I just want to get some answers or, info, like what I, or what can I do to speak up and to my teachers because my teachers aren't doing nothing about it, nobody aren't doing nothing about it. I'm the only one that taking action and put that on Facebook, talk to my friend. I just want to know. What can I do to just to spread the word out uh, to my school so the teacher can do, uh, can do something about it to just keep our name off the list and uh, so our school won't be closed. Okay, I say something really fast. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tian again. But I don't really, of course, I don't have a, a set solution right now. Oh, I don't have a set solution for you right now, but I noticed that there's one thing that we, like, we all have in common. That's a sense of it's not just a student problem, it's not just an educator problem, it's a community problem. So if the school is in danger, the community, it changes the whole climate of the community. So, oh, I'm sorry. It changes the whole climate of the community. So if the community is in a, a, a rough state, 
the school is going to be directly impacted. Just like if the schools, if education in the community is in a rough state, the community is directly impacted. So it's not about just getting students, not only students and teachers together, but even people who don't have children in the public school system or people who aren't involved to get into it because it affects everyone. And I think some people disconnect themselves because it's something that's not relevant to them. But what they don't understand is that things such as gang violence and just being together and cult and like ethnicity and like having a culture is important and school is like a direct, there's a direct connection between the two. They're not two separate entities. They're the same, at least to me. Thanks. Oh, I guess I will. Okay. Well, I just came up because um, in our individual groups, there are a lot of good points brought up. There were the points with schools serving as anchors. Like someone said, they, it should be an anchor and it serves as like, a way for the community to come together. And I just thought it was a really interesting, we had a really interesting conversation about how community is a, has a big impact on schools. And I think that to find a way to bridge, not only to get students and teachers together, but to get the entire community, people who aren't directly involved into the movement, and we can become bigger and stronger and achieve one common goal. And I think um, we were talking in our group as well about um, creating solutions. Um, we, there were a few people in the research side and the higher education side in our group. Um, and I think we were talking about um, creating solutions, presenting solutions to people, um, being able to have all that together, working as a team to brainstorm ideas together and actually having actionable steps because it's one thing to talk about things, but it's another thing to act to present to your principal that one thing here um, is a problem and I've done this before and I think here's X, Y, and Z steps that we can do to um, help the situation. Um, with school closings, I have no idea how to solve that. I am definitely not at your level, Karen. I don't, know uh, how to solve it. I, 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 don't I don't think we did very well on that. Um. Okay, so I think, but I think that the question is, who are the experts, yeah. okay? Yeah. And, and we need to take ownership of that which we are expert in. Because we have allowed other people to define us, to define our communities, and what we ought to be able to tackle is every single problem that we're talking about, we should be able to put a brain trust around in our communities. And it may not be the traditional person that you are used to going to. And I think that the more we focus on pushing out that talent and providing a space for that talent. I would like to, for example, um, talk about the space in which a nine-year-old, who just happens to be amongst us, Ashawn Johnson, if you don't know him, Ashawn, Ashawn, stand up, wave around. So when I met Sean Johnson, uh, Sean Johnson, the first thing I heard him say was he, he used the word empathy, and he used it appropriately, and and just in, not only just appropriately and in context, but I was like, who is this kid, right? I think everybody was. I just went over to him. He's like, he's, and he had a little suit on, and he was so so you know. So, but. Ashan then did not read from a speech at a big rally of about, I think there were like 10,000 people in the street, and he actually became like this sort of overnight sensation because he was able to encapsulate the message, we are not toys, he said. You know, we are not toys. And, and I mean, that moved me in such a way, I was screaming, you know, Ashan for mayor, Ashan for mayor. So, uh, but what I'm trying to say is you will be surprised at where your experts are. And they have to be given front and center and we have to develop this talent and it cannot just be the traditional, you know, like me, old gray haired, whatever. I mean, it just has to, we have to have this very fluid group of people 
who bring something to the table. So in your community, um, you know, I'm not going to say you're going to win a fight about a school closing because once the Board of Education, the Department of Ed, whatever they call it in, in your town, has made this decision they're going to take your school, they're going to take it. Now the question is, what do you do about it? So last year we had parents occupying buildings. You know, now it wasn't organized particularly well, but it was certainly a great idea. So. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what people decide to do, but whatever it is, we need to support them. And, and here's the other piece. When we are in groups, please remember, don't yuck my yum, right? So if somebody has, yes, if somebody has a great idea and you don't necessarily think it's great because you can't figure out how to see it through, don't just rain on it. Take the problem and work the problem. If something seems far-fetched, allow those people who have got ideas to have a space and a safe space in which they're not judged, but that if you are good at logistics, you should be working on logistics and not worrying about ideas. And if you're good at ideas, leave the logistics to somebody who's good at that. People need to recognize what your talents are and bring that to the table. So everybody has a part to play. We can no longer be bystanders to the life. Thank you, Gary. One, one minute. So speaking of logistics and, uh, and, and that, that, we, that we really need to recognize expertise, I want to see if there are others who wanted to join the stage to, and, and, thank, and thank you for the four who, who came up and shared. Um, as we are getting new folks, I do want to say uh, around the school closings, there is an assembly session tomorrow morning that is focusing on the topic of school closings, um, on the topic of uh, Ani's topic of uh, online sort of connecting. You know, Ed Lib has a with us serve. I think we need to follow up with each other as much as possible about these ideas and make them concrete. And the assembly spaces tomorrow uh, are really what that, what what that's what those are for. Those are for concretizing some plans to build this movement. Um, so could we do a quick, so I, I'm just looking at time, we're going to have about 10 minutes for this round, um, so we're going to need to keep our comments tight uh, to be able to get folks, uh, sh get folks expertise out, on, out into the space. Um, you want to just we'll quickly introduce yourselves, the new folks, where you're from, name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Rashawn Bliss, I'm from Denver, Colorado, and <laughs> all right, I knew there were people here, uh, and I work with a group called the Colorado Student Power Alliance. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Israel. Uh, I'm here from Chicago. I just graduated from Kelly High School, and and uh, I'm, I guess you could say, one of the founding members of the Chicago Students Organizing to Save Our Schools, soon to be the Chicago Student Union. My name is Jasmine Henry, and I'm here from Detroit. Ain't nobody else here from Detroit? Well, that's okay, I'm a rep for Detroit. <laughs> and I am a parent and I also um, work at my kids' school and I do activism and that kind of stuff. Hi, I'm Nancy Potter, I'm from Pittsburgh. And I'm an attorney at the Education Law Center. So I, the, the people in the booth just told me we have time for folks to try to kind of share their questions. Why don't we get it all out into the space and then we can kind of talk about it. So if the new folks can kind of share your, your question um, and, uh, and thought quickly, we can. Oh, Ashan. Hello. Hello. I've seen you on TV. YouTube. YouTube TV. Nice to have you. Do you want to introduce yourself? My name is uh, Sean Johnson. I am also a part of CSU, and I will be doing a youth forum. Me, me and my mom are trying to get that together. We're trying to do a youth forum and help. Like anybody is welcome, not just the kids. Like the grown-ups, they can come to tell them how they want to save their schools. This is like I'm like meeting celebrities. All right. <laughs> So, folks, uh, 
can we let's get it all out into the space just for the time, and then we can try to see what see what see what that brings us in the next in the next like eight minutes. Since I have the microphone, I'll go first. Um, I just wanted to say that as I've gone through the past few days, um, I've oftentimes heard people say things like, "A student said, my school board said students aren't allowed to testify at school board hearings." or a parent was told that they didn't have this certain right or that Title VI didn't apply to them. And so I have a comment and a question in relation to that. My first comment is, as cheesy as it sounds, knowledge is power. And the fact is that the legal system in this country in some ways has been set up to further that oppression that we've been talking about during these past few days. And if you're gonna fight that oppression, you have to understand the legal system that's happening in. So, my challenge to students and parents and teachers um, is to understand the law, to teach each other the law, and to make sure that you understand what your rights are, where the law is oppressing you, and how you can change it. Other attorneys in the room, my challenge is to you is to use those pro bono hours, your volunteer time, to support these families and students and teachers and community organizers. And I guess the question I would put out to all of you um, who've been up here on this panel is how do you use the attorneys, the legal advice, the resources out there to connect your members to understanding that system and how to change it and what their rights are? So we're, we're uh, just to get things straight, we're asking a question right now or, so, okay. Um, so uh, as a student organizer, you know, students are, you know, I, I guess we make about 80% about of education because of course there's teachers who play a large part of the, well, who, are, who make up a large part of the education population, um, for lack of a better words. But uh, we're all part of this system and we're all oppressed in one way or another, whether it, it be the, the, the contracts that the Chicago Teachers Union or any other teachers are subject to, or, and then there's the students who are in the classroom that have no air conditioning, the classrooms are overpacked, they have no books. You know, all of these things are forms of oppression, and because we're in that same system, my question is, how can teachers and students start working together to fight you know, the, this giant conglomeration, this si giant system of oppression that has been pressing down on us for so long? That, that is my question. I was sparked to join in the conversation based on the second question that we were, that we were discussing. Given the issues and tensions in our communities, how then do we work together? And in Detroit, that is something that we have not overcome. We cannot overcome at this point. And, you know, it's frustrating as a parent to not be able to work together to move forward. And Detroit is a unique situation because we're like ground zero, you know, and we're under the auspices of not only a financial manager for our city, but also for our school system. So we have two individuals that have undermined the, the, we have an elected school board, but they can't do their job. We have an elected city council and mayor, but he, they can't do their jobs either. And so, you know, that's kind of my thought. And, and the nature of the system in Detroit, kids are, are being pushed out and not pushed out in the conventional sense because of discipline issues, but they're being pushed out because of economics. And so the parents that can take their children elsewhere, they do. And there are charters that pop up in the city, outside of the city, and so what you're left with is a vacuum. And how do we then reach those people? Because that's really where the people power is. So a lot of the things actually Israel took out of my mouth. Um, but I'm with, uh, I'm actually a graduate student and I'm actually a graduate student who's dropped out of graduate school because of student debt. Um, and 
I do a lot of my my organizing on um, the K-12 level, or I'm sorry, the, high, the higher ed level, um, but I work with and have lots of friends who work on the K-12 level and I try to be in solidarity, especially the College Student Power Alliance. We are also trying to form a statewide student union, um, like not a confusingly named building on a campus. Uh, and that is, um, a big part of my focus and the issues at higher ed um, are mirror in lots of ways the issues at K-12, but in many ways they don't, right? There is actually like a difference. Um, and my question is really, how do we build a pre-K through postdoc sort of um, spectrum of this movement because the whole thing is under attack. It's not just K-12 or higher ed, it's both. Um, and we have to, we have to um, figure out ways to, to bridge the kind of organizing gap that there has been. Um, and especially, um, just to echo what Israel was saying, is how do we get students empowered themselves um, and working and working in solidarity with teachers? Because where teachers can't do things and can't take risks, we're down. We are so into that. And like, there's a lot of things that, that we can't do that we need teachers and staff's help. So my question is really like, how do, to, to, to just amplify what Israel is saying, how do we get the students um, involved in, in a much more primary way uh, as well uh, as teachers and, and community and parents, but then also how do we bridge that higher ed K-12 divide? What can we do to unite the fronts? Thank you. Um, I do, I wanna, so, we, we're running short of time. I just want to acknowledge, one, that these questions are, are complicated, and of course, we're not going to answer them right now in this moment. I do want to invite the panelists uh, to respond briefly to anything that was raised. Um, try to keep it to like a minute. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge that uh, my good friend Curtis Acosta has been giving me time signs that I've been um, duly ignoring. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I see you, Curtis, and uh, and and then I want to invite Ash Ashan for you to, to for you to close us out with your your statement, if that's if that seems right to you to you when we're when they're finished. Does that make sense? All right. Well, I want to answer um, Nancy's question about what we're doing. Uh, with the connection to the legal community. In New Orleans, we worked with the Southern Poverty Law Center to address the, the, uh, the structural problems in New Orleans and how special education students were not getting their needs met. And we also filed a Title VI complaint around school closings, uh, you know, and, and that's a process. But there also, uh, many of us have also taken on the tactic of, uh, we apply for a freedom of information request and our state flatly just refuses to comply. So now lawsuits are being filed around that. We just believe that wherever you can get, uh, a legal remedy, you need to go down that route because this is going to be uh, dealt with in a legal way, whether it's legislated or litigated. I'm so conflicted about this um, because the problem to me with the legal system is that it doesn't end like and wrap everything up in loose, you know, nice little bow at the end of the hour like on TV. And, and one of the problems we have is, is how do you also manage people's expectations? Um, so um, we sue the heck out of Chicago Public Schools. They're not used to being sued by the union, but we have been doing it. We have extraordinarily capable attorneys that do different things also. I mean, you must also differentiate amongst your, your legal career. I mean, we have uh, attorneys that are strictly labor law and their contract negotiators. We have attorneys that do class action pieces. Um, and we have attorneys that specialize in like crazy federal stuff. You know, I mean, just the ones that you have to just let go for a moment to think of something. And they're all brilliant. That's the beauty of it. And, and they're bird dogs. I mean, they, they are like a dog with a bone. I mean, we got a lawyer that just looks at pensions and stuff like that. So it, you have to utilize that. But the legal system is also their system. It's their playing field. They have an advantage. So part of the problem that I have that I'm conflicted about, and I think we all need to speak to on some level, is when you use the system, you know, understand that you're losing your leverage in that grassroots media because they own it, control it, and what they'll do is change the rules on you. 
you know? So, so I mean, you have to do it. But sometimes when I pay legal bills, I, I know I have to do it, but it is, it, is, it, is, it is hard sometimes to justify that kind of expense because, you know, good lawyers cost you money. If you, it, it, you cannot expect everybody to do pro bono work, and neither should they. But okay, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> but, um, but I also want to talk about the notion of student organizing because I think it is absolutely imperative. And again, you all do not have to recreate the wheel. Um, I think that's really important. The beauty that what you all have access to is the technology to move your movement forward. But your ideas have to be the same. You coalesce about, around where your strengths are. So. You know, the notion that uh, people in K-12 can have conversations with people in higher ed is absolutely mandatory because if we're pushing people to all go to college, folks need to understand two things. One, the student debt is insanity. But also, when you go to college, where are the jobs? Where are the jobs? Because the people that control the money are not creating jobs. So we cannot allow people to be called job creators just because they're wealthy. No, these people are job destroyers. So we need to, we need to always speak the truth about what is going on. But if we are creating jobs that require a seventh grade education, because that's what's being created now, temp jobs, Walmart jobs, these are the people where, why are we buying from Walmart? Why don't we call right now? That is a nationwide discussion. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, Roshan, I think you mentioned something about how, uh, how, kinda, how to inspire students to, to become organizers, uh, something along, along those lines. But uh, um, I, I just want to ask the audience right now, if you're a teacher, could you please raise your hand? Yeah, so we have a lot of teachers here. Um, <laughs> so my, my introduction to activism well, I, actually, I want to go a few steps back. Um, I, I just want to begin by minute. saying that our teachers are some of the biggest role models for students. And what you do is going to jump onto us in some format or another. And my introduction to activism or, uh, emerged during the Chicago Teachers Union. And during, this uh, during the Chicago Teachers Union strike, I'm sorry. Um, and during that time, I saw that it, it, was a, it, was a not, it was an action, it was an event when my teachers finally said no. And this entire time, I, I'd grown up in an educational system uh, in a working class neighborhood where our schools weren't allocated the best resources. And I'd seen, I'd been to schools that were always needy my entire life, and I knew that these were a lot of problems that were present in our schools, the lack of books, lack of building maintenance, and things of that nature. And when my teacher said no, I saw that finally we could do something about it. But then I noticed that, you know, when I turned on the news, there wasn't that many students. They, they were talking about how, how greedy the teachers were and things like that, and I was like, wait, this affects me just as much as uh, it affects the teachers. This is also uh, this is also my fight. So, b based on their courageous action, I was inspired to try to create an organization, and not just me, but several other students across the city. And I think what is necessary to have students involved is teachers must take the first steps because you are setting the example for us. And one thing that I've learned is that people learn through example. They learn through example, and when we see our teachers standing up, then you're kind of telling us to stand up as well, because this is also our fight. And although you may not tell us that directly, we're going to observe that, and we're going to learn that from you. So that is some advice that I could give to any teacher, regardless of where you are, where you are, you know, which city, whatever. You know, take the first step, and students will follow. Thank you. Sharon or Sean, do you have any last quick comments that you want to share, or will we can move to Sean as well? But Sharon. I have one too. Sorry. 
Well, um, if you want to keep in contact with the Philadelphia Student Union, um, you can follow us on Facebook at Philadelphia Student Union and on Twitter, um, 215 Student Union. And, um, and our website is philadelphiastudentunion.org. No, phillystudentunion.org. Uh, thank you. I guess my last thought is just that, um, like, you have here three student unions at, at a couple different levels represented here. That's serious, and people need to realize that there's a growing student movement. Like, we're doing our own thing, and we own this shit. Like, it's our future. Seriously, it's about, like, our future moving forward, and we have the biggest stake. Y'all, like, the, the teachers, the teachers are in the classrooms right now, but we're, you're building the world for us in the future, and there's so many things to, to, for us to fight for. Think of us as allies. Please, please, for the love of God, get involved with your students and figure out how you can support their organizing and how they can support your organizing, too. We have to have more solidarity and that K-12 higher ed gap, we have to figure out ways because a lot of the problems we are facing in K-2 and in higher ed started in K-12 and are just getting exacerbated there. And we have to fix that. We have to fix the leak upstream, right? We have to get the problem where it starts. So help us help you, please. I'd just like to echo Israel's uh, sentiments with, uh, you know, Sister Travis talked about our great labor leader Sister Travis talked about you know demonstrating that commitment to the people in order to re receive you know that reciprocal commitment I think we as teachers have to uh, have to model that definitely going back to Israel's question um, I really think it um, goes to the parents and like the teachers unions and also the students I don't want to exclude the students but like I really think it starts with the parents and teachers because there's a lot of par parents organizations like because like the parents need to get involved with their children and the um, teachers need to get involved with their students so if we can all come together as a unity then there will be no stopping us no one can stop us and that's why I think the government is afraid of if he knows that we could if he knows that we could come together as a unit if he knows that we can come together as a unit, there will be no stopping us. And he knows that. That's why he's trying to break us down into different unities. That's why he's trying to mess us up and not get us toward our future so we can have a better future for ourselves. All right. I asked, I asked Hassan if he wanted to just drop the mic, but he, he's too courteous to, to, to be mean to the mic. All right. I want us to, a big round of applause for everybody in this space. And, and a big free minds. And I want to I want to give just an extra shout out to to Sharon and Karen and Sean and Karen um, for for just coming and getting this framed and, and doing what they do on a day to day and, and helping us through this. So one more round of applause for them.